My name is Brian Vaughn. I am a member of the Society for the Advancement of Sexual Health, otherwise known as SASH. I am the Networking and uh, Membership Committee Chair. I have been a member of SASH for a number of years, and over this past year, we have um, been engaging spiritual leaders on the importance of equipping them as best possible when their faith leaders or when their faith members come to them to address issues of sexuality, sexual compulsive behavior, otherwise known as addiction, and, and most importantly, how they can move on with their lives. This is our uh, third webinar that we have done so far. We're very, very excited today that we have a really great cross-section of folks here with us, today, with us today. So the topic of today is engaging spiritual leaders, lived experience of women with the patriarchy. Joining me today is also Gina Kay, who is my co-facilitator today. But briefly, I am a, a certified sex addiction therapist at Riverside Counseling in Fredericksburg, Virginia. We want to especially note today that this uh, webinar is focusing at this point on the heterosexual cisgendered male and females. We know that there needs to be a much larger discussion about others who may have been impacted by the patriarchal structure. And there are many other genders and orientations. We hope to do so in future talks. So now I'd like to turn it over to my co-facilitator, colleague and friend, Gina Kay. It's good to be here. It's good to be co-facilitating. Uh, just a little bit of background about who I am. Uh, my background is health science and I hold a master's in health education from the University of Texas at Austin. Austin, Texas is my home. Uh, my work has been in nonprofit, university, corporate, and faith-based settings. And I'm a former pastor's wife. I'm also trained as a behavioral health specialist. And so I have this unique ability to uh, build bridges between these two communities and help fill in some of the knowledge gaps. And that has definitely become a big passion of mine is to merge my lived experience and my training to educate, advocate, coach, and consult. Um, I've been a member of SASH for six years now, and it's my honor to help facilitate this conversation. Just to uh, mention again, like the topic as we're addressing the lived experience of women with patriarchy, I think it's important to define that word. Um, patriarchy is a system in which men hold the power and women are largely excluded. Um, it's also, uh, it has to do with men being the head, women feeling subordinate. Um, and that's what we're gonna be addressing is that, and it's an uncomfortable, it can be an uncomfortable conversation, just like racism, where it brings up feelings and reactions. And so know that this is normal. We're addressing something that's hard to look at, but it's real. And so we just ask that everyone that comes to this conversation have an open mind and just be willing to um, try to deepen understanding. And our hope is to create positive change in the world. And to also, we'll acknowledge the fact that this is part of a larger conversation. I mean, we're having it today with SASH, but there, there is a larger conversation going on in the world, and we're just taking part in that. Um, all right, let's introduce our panelists and those that have joined us for this conversation. I'm going to ask each of them uh, to tell you who they are and why they believe this is an important conversation. So we'll start with Zach Lambert. I, uh, I'm a pastor in Austin, Texas. Um, that's my home. I was born and raised here, and uh, we moved back to Austin, my wife and I, um, about seven years ago to begin the process of starting a church called Restore. Uh, we launched it in February of 2016, so we'll be six years old next month and uh, then do a lot of community engagement work. One of our core values is partnerships, and so we work with both faith-based and non-faith-based non nonprofit organizations all over the city and around the world um, in order to help bring restoration to individuals and neighborhoods. Um, in our city and all over the place. So that's kind of our goal. I think this is such a vital conversation uh, because um, I encounter women um, 
constantly in church structures that have been um, really hurt by patriarchal practices and, and patriarchal men. Um, it's very common inside of church structures. I'm happy to be a small part of trying to bring down the patriarchy as a cishet white man. My name is Kat Etherington. I'm uh, joining from the northeast of England as the director for recovery with a UK based charity named Naked Truth Project. Um, part of our mission or, or really our, our overall mission is to open eyes and free lives from the damaging impact of pornography. And as a, a Christian faith based organization, part of how we do that is equipping the local church to have um, informed, educated and helpful conversations around that topic. So the work that I do as head of recovery is really focused in that sort of free lives section and I oversee all of the work of Naked Truth Recovery, where we uh, support men and women who are seeking recovery from problematic sexual behaviours and their families and uh, spouses or partners. And I think this is an important conversation because so many of our um, clients are reaching out to their faith communities as their first port of call when crisis hits their relationship their marriage or their personal life and so many of our clients have a story to tell of increased trauma of uh, increased uh, kind of uh, being being cast out of their communities and and it really just breaks my heart to know that a place that should be safe and a place that should be helpful is is so often a place where people are more hurt more traumatized and more ashamed than when they first reached out so that's why I think we need to have this conversation. I come from a little different background um, in that I was kind of launched into uh, my ministry or advocacy work um, when my pastor sued me in a defamation lawsuit for $500,000 for speaking out against uh, the spiritual abuse um, that my family incurred. Um, through that, I, I gained um, a, a quite an audience and a lot of people were, um, you know, just shocked, but I got a lot of stories about people who had been harmed in the church and they started following my blog. My blog is called Spiritual Sounding Board. And when you look at the beginning of my blog, um, you might detect that I was okay with a power over structure in a marriage. Um, that's because that's what I was living under. And slowly that evolved as I was hearing more and more stories and finding myself weeping as I was listening to women's stories and realizing this is what I'm living with. And I couldn't figure out why I'm having all these health issues. But now I'm speaking out against it very loudly on Twitter. <laughs> Defend the Sheep is my Twitter name. And I, because of telling my story publicly, um, I've had so many women reach out to me privately and I'm able to get them connected with other women. And I really see this as a, a marvelous time for women um, to reach out to each other, hold, hold each other up. And there are tens of thousands of women that I know of because of these private groups that I've either been in or know of other advocates um, who are, are on that journey of getting educated and becoming free. So I'm glad to be a part of this conversation. I was raised, I was born into the LDS church. I feel like it was kind of handed to me and I did my best to carry it around and try to make it part of my life. Um, I did not grow up in a typical Mormon family if there actually is one. I was not okay. Um, in a power over marriage. I had seen that happen and play out for years in my parents' marriage. And I was okay if I never got married and if I never had kids because I was not going to do something like that. Um, I did get married. I, I think going in, we had conversations about that power over dynamic, about the house that I grew up in. And, you know, he knew my family. So we started out there, but we have, you know, come a long way in the 28, almost 29 years next month that we have been married. And I feel like we've grown a lot together. I'm an LCSW and I, I'm a certified sex addiction therapist. I actually own um, the, the group practice that I practice in and, um, you know, getting to be a female owner working with sex addiction 
um, I had a lot of experiences with the patriarchy as I carved out being a business owner and um, working in this particular niche and with this population. Um, I feel like I, you know, working with women, I, I feel like often women, I, I can even see in my past times where I was part of my subordination. Um, I work with, you know, partners who have experienced betrayal trauma and are also part of their own subordination. Um, I've been told I have a lot of patience. What they don't know is I'm also really angry. <laughs> And I try to not let that come out. And we just have to look at things. We have to ask things. We have to be able to explore. And in that process, we have to have grace with ourselves and with other people. Um, recovering from sex addiction or pornography addiction, the clients that I work with, I think also we do not talk nearly enough about females who are experiencing a sex and love addiction. Um, we kind of operate on this assumption that the addicted partner is a male and there just are not a lot of resources or options for females who are um, dealing with sex and love addiction or pornography addiction. Um, so I, I think that's one thing we have to start looking at in my field. If we're, if we are certified sex addiction therapists, we have to be asking ourselves why we're not looking or being open to female sex and love addicts. Now, obviously there are some in the community who are, but not nearly enough and the resources are still limited. One thing I just want to add, I feel like, you know, part of my experience coming into this niche and being a business owner, and I said that I had experiences with patriarchy in that, you know, I don't know how pervasive this is outside of my community or outside of my state, but I feel like there was kind of this thinking that men talked with men about pornography and sex addiction. And I very much believe that women's voices have to be part of that recovery and part of that healing, or it just can't be complete. I do not see how for men talking only to men and not having women as voices as part of that. And a lot of them that I work with, it takes a long time before their partner can be one of those voices. Um, I find as a therapist, often I'm one of those very first voices that they start to let in. Um, you know, but the thinking was, I, I've been told multiple times that as a woman, I should not be working with male sex addicts. And I am very comfortable saying, I don't agree with that. I agree that we have to have women working with male sex addicts. I wanted to talk about why I feel like this is such an important conversation. As much as I can say, I wasn't comfortable with the power over dynamic. I also, as we started to talk about and then have kids, I, I didn't say this at first, but I knew I didn't want daughters. And I knew that that was because I had not reckoned with my own femaleness and my own femininity and what that meant. And so I have four daughters and I think these conversations, these discussions are so important. I know when I had my first daughter, I started to feel this pull to be part of making a difference in our world. And my youngest is 18. And while there has been progress, there has not been nearly the progress that I hoped for in the 25 years since I had my first daughter. So I feel like as we have these discussions, when we have conversations about what our history actually has looked like as a, as a people, not just what has been written and what has been told to us through male perspectives, but actually what we are learning from archaeologists now who are also females. Um, when we start to give this knowledge and information to both women and males, I think it changes the conversation. And I think it can begin to make subordination more difficult. And I think as women understand their history and have a knowledge of their power and what that looked like at times prior to patriarchy, I think that leads to emancipation. Michelle Neverdon and I am a trauma therapist and have been for about 10 years. And so I come from a little different perspective. I also helped, uh, was consulting on a human trafficking group that got together. And I, I do a lot in the church, the PCA church, and I do a lot with, um, uh, racial trauma. I'm often called to talk in churches about all of these subjects. I work with Brian and I also have my own practice. So I've kind of merged with them, but I still have clients I see uh, mostly military because of the PTSD component. I guess I see the devastation of a whole bunch of things 
in church and as far as sexual abuse trauma, I mean, it, it's, it's huge. Um, racial trauma is huge. So all these things are going on at this time in the country and this is the ripe time uh, for me and for everybody here to be instrumental in changing the way we think about uh, these matters and the way our clients think about them and the people that we touch think, think about them. So I'm, I'm happy to be part of the group and uh, hope that I can contribute um, as others will in some productive way. So without uh, further ado, we're going to proceed. As uh, Gina mentioned earlier, she and I are gonna be alternating back and forth. Um, I'm going to start, start us off with um, the initial question. Let's define the problem. It's an open-ended question. So whoever would like to start and let's again reflect and talk about together what the problem is. I'll break with tradition. We Brits usually like to stand in the queue for as long as we can, but I'll, <laughs> um, I think that's a really interesting question. And I think probably uh, the answer to that question, what's the problem is it depends on who you ask um, what the problem is. And I think, you know, each of us represents a slightly different story and a slightly different maybe client base or, um, and so, you know, if you asked the clients that I talk to regularly, what's the problem? Um, they would say church doesn't feel like a safe place for me and I think maybe when you sort of boil it all down that's probably uh, at least one of the sort of cruxes of the problem is that um, the women that I speak to um, often um, are reaching out for help in a really vulnerable time in their life. Um, inevitably, the people they have the opportunity to reach out to help for are men who in, in, invariably don't feel safe as a, as a kind of gender um, experience. And so um, that's, that's part of the problem. But I think ultimately what it comes down to is that the church doesn't, I mean, and I'm talking about church from a Christian perspective. I didn't say in my introduction, but my, my husband is actually a pastor of a, um, a minister of a, a Baptist church here in the UK. And so I think that a lot of women, um, when you really examine their experience of church, often feel like church is not a safe place for them. I'm actually going to chime in because, yeah, it is, it's a challenge to try to define the problem, right? Narrow it down. And I would say for me, I'm like one of the core things about the problem for me is the devaluing of women. And um, that like what you were saying, Kat, about when as a woman in, a, in the church uh, faith settings and communities I was in, women couldn't hold positions of, they couldn't have the title pastor, they couldn't have the title elder. So you're right, that feeling of safety of like, if you're gonna go turn to a faith leader, it's gonna be a man. And if they don't, if they view you as inferior, inferior or they don't value your voice enough to even have you in the rooms, or if you're a female to even recognize that there's limitations, uh, uh, you know, always that there should be women being brought into certain conversations and when they're not, that's a problem. So yeah, like what Jackie was sharing too, about just like, we are so valuable. Like that to me is my experience. I know my value now. I don't apologize for that. I'm not inferior as a woman. And I just think that there, that's part of the problem is just a general system with an imbalance. Uh, one of the things that I noticed was, you know, in the, in my uh, church patriarchy circles, and I never even called it patriarchy. It just was church, but this was the setup. So when you go to church leaders, but you have the understanding of the teaching that men are the spiritual head, they are the heads of the home, um, the default becomes believe the man or the husband over the wife because they are supposed to be the spiritual head. So consequently, when a woman goes to uh, church leaders and says, hey, there's a problem going on here, a lot of times the default is to go to the spiritual head of the home, the, the father, the husband, and get his uh, perception first. The understanding is, is that he's going to be more knowledgeable, going to be able to say what's really going on. So automatically, the woman's voice 
is not held to the same level as the man's voice. And so we're at a deficit. And also there's these teachings that say women are easily deceived. We are emotional, um, a lot of things like that. So we are dismissed. Our words are dis dismissed. Our testimony is dismissed in lieu of, you know, the husband's word and testimony. So we have an uphill battle from the very beginning. And a lot of times what happens when a woman reports to a pastor and the, and the husband is believed over the wife, then the wife's testimony is automatically dismissed, end of story. And where does she go now? The church is unsafe for her. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really good, Julianne. Um, I just want to build off of all of that, um, all three of you. Uh, I think the problem that I see is this idea of like biblical patriarchy, um, that somehow these patriarchal systems are endorsed by scripture. Um, and usually the way that it's taught, and I'm talking about the Bible specifically, usually the way that it's taught is that the husband and wife come together and they become one flesh, the terminology used in scripture, and that's um, interpreted as giving up individual desires and joining all of your desires together. Um, but the husband is the head of the wife in this traditional teaching. Um, and so what that really means is that he is in charge of the one flesh. So it prioritizes his desires and his desires are the de facto desires of the one flesh. Um, so rather than both giving up to form something new, what ends up happening is these kind of two become one, um, but really it's just the woman kind of coming under the desires of the husband. And then the husband leads the household. So it's not just that his desires are primary in the husband wife relationship but his desires are primary in the children's relationships and that you know descends into economic decisions and other household decisions things like that and really in this model biblical patriarchy the only uh, entity that the male is supposed to submit to is other male elders in a church setting um, and so it even stacks up men in elder roles in church settings even higher. And that's how you see so many patriarchal abuses in church settings. If you listen to like the Rise and Fall of Mars Hill podcast about Mark Driscoll and all of that stuff, he very purposefully set up the church in this way, this hierarchy of biblical patriarchy in order to consolidate power, where really his only reporting was to, to God, um, which he got to speak for. So that became a little dicey. Um, and so you can see uh, how scripture, in my opinion, is perverted um, to uh, be interpreted in this way that centers men and men's feelings and men's desires. Um, and you see this in, in truly egregious ways. So let me just give you a, a quick example. Um, biblical translations, I think most of us are probably familiar that the Bible we have was written in other languages, <laughs> uh, primarily Greek and Hebrew. Um, and some in Aramaic. And, uh, and so you have a passage that's really famous from Ephesians 5, right, that says, wives submit to your husbands, husbands love your wives. And that's a text that's pulled out and used um, in this biblical patriarchy theology. Um, what's really interesting is when you had the, the New International Version, the NIV, which is the most popular, one of the most popular versions um, in North America, at least um, for biblical interpretation, uh, it, the latest one before 2011 came out in 1984. When they were reinterpreting 2011, rewriting it for the 2011 NIV, they were doing so to try to make it more true to the text with more gender neutral terminology. So for instance, when it would say mankind um, or man, they would say men and women, right? They were trying to update it to better reflect the original intention of the text um, because it had been interpreted in these ways that were more colloquial than actually interpretive of the whole of humanity when it was talking about these things. Well, there was a group of men, um, specifically men who run something called the, the Center for Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, which is a super toxic patriarchal organization. Um, and they decided to get together with some other patriarchal male schol scholars and um, do their own interpretation of scripture, um, which came out as the English Standard Version or the ESV. Um, and they preemptively did it that came out right before the new NIV was supposed to come out. And they made a number of very patriarchal decisions with the ESV interpretation. So back to my Ephesians 5 example. So Ephesians 5, 21, verse 21 says, um, Christians submit yourselves to one another. Verse 22 says, wives submit to your husbands. Verse 23 says, husbands love your wives, which the love there is a sacrificially submissive term. So it's that all three of those verses together teach mutual submission to each other. 
Christians, husbands, wives, all relationships that we're submitting to one another. There's not a head in any way, shape, or form that what's Paul's teaching here, right? Well, um, what the ESV did is actually put a subheading in between verse 21 and verse 22. And so 21, Christians submit to one another, is left in a, se a, um, a section above it that is subheaded like instructions for Christians. And then verse 22 and below is subheaded instructions for households. And so it makes it look like there's a division there when there actually isn't at all in the original text. And it's used to further cement this biblical patriarchy theology. Um, so that's just one example. I could do a lot, but I have a huge problem with biblical interpretation, what I would call, you know, biblical perversion in order to continue to promote this idea of biblical patriarchy, um, which is a real problem. Thanks, Zach. I wanted to add to that too. Um, and I'm, I'm not, I, I will say now, I'm not a practicing part of any religion, um, but, and so I'm not exactly sure I was following if I was following though I, I feel like as a woman where I'm at today if we're going to say women submit to husbands husbands love your wives even if that's a submissive form I just have an issue with using two different words when one of them is submit like we should both be submitting or we should both be loving and I think for me like that's part of the problem with patriarchy right and you talked about so many issues with biblical patriarchy, which is, um, that's when, like, we, we got the Bible when people started writing, but, well, not people, males, males started writing, right? All of the authors of the Bible are males. And I've, you know, been a teacher in my faith where I was teaching Sunday school and kind of putting in my perspective or my meaning as a female and been told by a male that I'm misinterpreting scripture or I'm speaking out of turn, right? And just saying, well, there's no, there's no perspective for me in this. So I'm adding it. I'm adding it here. I'm not telling you, you have to believe it. I'm telling you, I'm adding it. You know, eventually long story short, I was called in and told I was a harmful influence and could not be trusted. And I said, okay, I'm done. However, I also think we have to know, we have to have the knowledge that for thousands of years, we didn't, we, we didn't live a patriarchal model, right? As human beings, we lived a partnership model for thousands of years. We weren't writing things down, but we were living a partnership model. We've never had matriarchal models where women ruled over men, but these partnership models looked more like egalitarian models where women had equal access to power, males had access to power. And so we were working together. There wasn't this gender split or these gender differences and there wasn't hierarchy. Um, and I think that's important to understand that it's, it's this patriarchy and, and maybe we're going to talk about that today. I don't know where the conversation's going, but it's, it was a slow turning that moved into patriarchy and started to establish hierarchies and started to have, you know, like where some men were able to have power over other men and all women. And I think that's a huge problem because we don't have female perspectives. There weren't, even though we can talk about priestesses being there, you know, we also learned from Cheryl, Cheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, and some of the research that she cited in there, that having one female or two females or something like that isn't enough to provide equality or to, to, to have an inclusive environment for all people at the table. Like one or two cannot like stem the tide against what has been written in the Bible, what has been practiced and believed for thousands of years. I want to um, transition us into the next question. I think what you were just saying, Jackie, about the, the hierarchy and where's the inclusion and the equality, um, something I've been paying attention to is there's a lot more diversity, equality, and inclusivity in the workplace these days. Like there's positions with that title. People are hiring a DEI director. Um, and it's not that these initiatives haven't ever existed, but even just in the last couple of years, I mean, there is a surge in our American culture to expand these initiatives. Why? You know, if there was already in inclusivity and equality, 
and diversity, we wouldn't be doing that. There's it to me, that's a, just a plain um, acknowledgement <laughs> that there is an imbalance. Uh, and you know, we, there's podcasts on this, there's books on this. Um, talk for a minute about where do you see that this conversation happening in the mainstream and who else is talking about it? I, I think there's a lot of podcasts out there that are talking about patriarchy and about the lack of inclusivity. Um, I think there's authors of books, right? Like I've, I, you know, I've, I've read some really great books that kind of informed and educated myself about my history as a woman and what that looked like before patriarchy. And those books were written in my lifetime, right? They were, um, I think both written when I was a, in high school in the eighties, 86 and 87, I think. And I didn't hear about these until like two years ago. And you know, part of me, I was like, why, why wasn't I learning this in high school? Why didn't I read these books? Now I know why, right? I know why we, in our country, we're having a hard time right now in my state, even talking about critical race theory, which we didn't ever even teach in K through 12. So I get, I was never, I was never going to be assigned a book to read or write a paper on or have my teacher stand up and teach me about the origins of patriarchy, understanding, um, you know, cultures and societies that existed prior to patriarchy. I was never going to get that. Those books were there. I don't even know why I never heard about them until I was 49 years old. Like, I, I didn't know, right? But I do think, I mean, there's some podcasts out there that I think are great. Um, I learn from those podcasts. I share those podcasts with some of my female friends, I share them with my daughters, my husband, we start to have conversations, but there's also a lot of women I know that I would not share those podcasts with because we can't have those conversations because they don't see the issue and they're fine with things the way they are and they don't want change. And they think that I'm not being grateful or that I'm too angry, or, you know, the problem is always mine. So I have my small group, happy to be part of this. I was happy to get invited as a panelist on this. I think there are resources out there, but there's not enough of these conversations happening. I think that's where, you know, for, to use Bible terms, you know, for those that have ears, let them hear, you know, and I, it's like, there is, um, this desire to open up the conversation and really the, um, the request is just, are you willing to listen? And because change can't happen massively until there's awareness and recognition. So that's why, yeah, we're even having these conversations or being willing to read a book or being willing to sit with someone and listen about their lived experience, that willingness um, just to be open and, and aware. And I think like, I have this book in front of me um, this is written in 2020. Diane Langberg is another name that's bringing a lot of attention to this specifically in the church of the um, power issues and authority issues, and it, which includes things like patriarchy. Uh, but yeah, she's publishing books right now talking about this. Diane Langberg, I, I sort of fangirl over Diane. She's, she has some amazing um our contributions to make to this conversation and I think you know the the responses to this conversation are as nuanced as the things that bring us to this conversation so as I was thinking about from a sort of sexual health perspective who is contributing to this conversation I brought my great sex rescue book um, because I'm equally fangirling over Sheila and the work that that she's doing over there and I think you know um the, the the patriarchy is a huge topic and you know you can read papers on that um uh, the attack it from all kinds of different perspectives but from a sexual health perspective i'm i'm following sheila i'm following diane langberg um i'm following gail dines who has um some really interesting perspectives on this topic and i'm following you know i think as i was thinking about how do you how do you talk about this issue i was thinking patriarchy and feminism of a scary words for people and what what it means is that the people who 
who need to be involved in conversations like this are self-excluding from those conversations, often because of the titles and the words that are used to, to, to even sort of bring the conversation. So there's a piece of me that's like, oh, I'm going to go talk with Sash about the patriarchy. And in a way, I already know I'm preaching to the choir, because if you're sitting in the audience of a, a presentation or a panel discussion like this, it's because you already know something that brings you to the table. And so it, it kind of makes me sad that the people who probably really need to be hearing this conversation and part of this conversation are already not here because patriarchy is a word they've made a choice about and made a decision about that is often pretty finite um, and so you know I, I think uh, the the real change is much more grassroots than I would like it to be. It's much more person to person. It's much more pasta to pasta. Um, it's much, and actually, sadly, a lot of that change is born out of pain. I think that's probably a common denominator that many of us have in terms of what brings us to this conversation. I was just chatting today with somebody about the the sort of existential crisis that often is required to crack us open to something new. Um, and, and, you know, I can say that as a, as a Christian, I didn't know what I didn't know. And I didn't need to know because I, I, was, I was all right functioning within the system within which I was functioning, trying to be faithful, reading the Bible that was divided and interpreted the way I didn't know that it was divided and interpretive and trying to do the best I could with what I had. And it wasn't until the impact of the patriarchy was front and center in my life that I had to start asking some of those really difficult questions. And, and I guess part of the problem is, where do I go to ask the difficult questions without facing all of the judgment and the exclusion that comes with that? And so, you know, I, I, although there are there are people talking about this and Sash is talking about this and the Association for Partners of Sex Addicts Trauma Specialists are teaching religious leaders about betrayal trauma. There are some really encouraging moves. And here in the UK, just a couple of weeks ago, I sat down with my 16 year old daughter and we watched a BBC documentary about rape culture in schools and and you know there are encouraging movements and sometimes I have to remind myself okay it might not be that I'm watching a patriarchy documentary but I am watching somebody talk about something that impacts young women and young girls that's really important and that is facilitating a conversation for me with my teenage daughters about what's your experience in school what's your experience of sexual harassment child on child sex abuse those are things that are getting spoken about so so I think, you know, inevitably the answer to who else is talking about this is not enough people. Um, but the ones who are, are usually doing so. And, and, you know, Julianne, I'm really encouraged that you're here. I've been sort of watching your Twitter and uh, re-sharing re a lot of your content for a lot of years, because I think the people who are willing to talk about it are a really powerful voice um, often. Thank you, Kat. I, I, I tell me, uh, you'll have to let me know what your uh, Twitter handle is. I appreciate that. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting that when I started sharing my story publicly about my abuse of marriage, my uh, followers increased uh, exponentially. And I, I really think that that's because my story connects with so many women, sadly. Um, there are some great women out there who um, I'm just really, really excited to be a part of uh, this time and, and place um, in social media. I, I was talking with um, Sheila, actually, a, a week ago, we had a, converse, a phone conversation. And I was telling her, one of the things that I was saying that a lot of the Theo bros, you know that term, Theo bros, a lot of them got their start on social media uh, a, over a decade ago, before I even started, and maybe 15 years ago, and they were the first on the social media scene. And what a what a fabulous job they did of promoting each other. And you know, woohoo! You got a new book out, and and you know, just they just pumped each other up and and got this huge audience. So anytime you went to one of their websites, you were seeing how to co connect with them on Facebook, how to connect with them on Twitter. Well, guess what? <laughs> the time has changed. There is no hierarchy on Twitter. <laughs> 
I, in my blogging, have been able to tag high name profile people and say, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are you saying this? And what is this message that you are um, presenting doing to women? So Twitter has given us a vehicle by which women now have a voice and just as loud of a voice as men and men cannot control that. And it drives them nuts. Oh, well, <laughs> but anyway, some great people um, who are using their voice and, and writing books. Um, Beth Allison Barr wrote The Making of Biblical Womanhood. That's another one that's recent. Uh, Kristen uh, Dumez, I think that's how you say her last name. Fantastic book um, exposing you know, the, the last century and who's been connected with whom. Another one that's near and dear to my heart and written by a close friend of mine, Gretchen Baskerville, she wrote The Life-Saving Divorce. This one to me is absolutely key for women in patriarchal marriages. First of all, because we have been taught, um, at least in my circles, it, divorce could only occur when there was infidel sexual, sexual infidelity or abandonment. Gret Gretchen um, goes to the original languages and tears this stuff apart. She goes to Micah where it says, um, you know, where people say God hates divorce. No, he hates the hardened heart that leads to divorce. So there's been a lot of misinterpretations. My very own pastor who I, I sought help from said, no, you, th this doesn't justify a divorce. Okay, well, I was dealing with emotional abuse, spiritual abuse, verbal abuse, and I was having chronic health issues. And I said, really, you, 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 this doesn't qualify and I'm dying. And I was on all these medications. Um, and he said, no, uh, some of you know my story that I, I had a, you know, we we parted ways and he's still a good, he was still a friend of mine. Um, and even though he told me what I believed was wrong information, I had a three hour meeting with him. His wife believed with me and, and said, I don't think he's thinking correctly. And I challenged him and I said, if you are saying that, then you're saying that God condones abuse, that I have to just stay married in this. So anyway, um, three hour conversation, long story short, um, last summer, he reached out to me and he says, I owe you an apology. I've done some digging. And he came over to my house in this room right here with my seven children and apologized to all seven of my children and to me for how he mishandled my case. Um, I would like to interview him one day and, and hopefully that will be instrumental for other pastors who have bought that line that there's only two reasons to get divorced, but Gretchen Baskerville's book is such a good resource. A lot of women are stuck in these marriages and don't think that they can leave. Yeah, you can. And God does not want us to stay in abuse. Yeah, that's so good, Julianne. Um, you're such a trailblazer in this area. Um, and I'm really grateful for it about what happened with your pastor is so important because there are uh you mentioned the theo bros kind of at the top of this that are um doing some really uh heinous things um there's also just thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of pastors who just don't know any different um this is what they've been taught this is what they perpetuate these cycles of abuse and it doesn't mean that they're innocent or anything like that but it does mean that um, they need serious education. And so I'm glad we're kind of throwing out resources. I um, uh, want to say Beth Allison Barr's book, Making a Book of Womanhood, that Julianne said is phenomenal. Um, I held up Jesus and John Wayne, Kristen Dumay's book, which looks at kind of the intersection of race and patriarchy and how that plays itself out. Um, I wanted to, to link, uh, I can put it in the chat, but um, Marg, um, Motsko, I, I, don't, I don't know how to say her last name actually, but I'll put it in here. Her website, she is, I think, um, the best, uh, and her website is the best as far as understanding um, what I believe are the correct interpretations of some of these clobber passages when it comes to patriarchy and women submission and things like that. She does incredible work in the text and looks deeply into these things and 
um, I, I think is so important. And, and I do think there's a vital role um, that, like I said, for education that, that these authors and people like Marg and, um, and others play. Um, and I'm a big fan of Twitter too, like Julianne, and uh, it's allowed me to connect with, with people like Julianne, but also people like Beth and Sheila and uh, Kristen Dumay and, and all of these. And, and what we've tried to do is take that and say, okay, Kristen, Beth, would you guys come on and do um, like a, a Zoom sermon uh, about what you've written? And let's talk about patriarchy and egalitarianism and how we interpret these things and, and just put it in front of our whole church. And um, we've got people who've been in kind of just typical evangelicalism their entire lives who um, hear that, who hear women preach at our church all the time and women are elders and all of that kind of stuff. And and it's like, you know, I've, I've been told this was wrong my whole life, but then I heard this woman preach and it was amazing. And uh, maybe I didn't understand that correctly. So let's dig in a little bit. And so I think, yeah, I think we can't undersell the role of education um, in this process of just helping people understand that there's a different interpretive lens. Like Jackie said earlier, um, not only was the majority of the Bible written by men, um, and uh, but the last... 2000 years of interpretation has been done exclusively by very powerful men, um, which I think is a much bigger problem than any of the original writing. Um, Cause I think that you see a trajectory of even with Jesus interacting with women, um, how he had uh, women who were his disciples, women who were apostles in the early church, women who were pastors and church planters um, like Junia and uh, others like that, Lydia, um, you even see when Jesus uh, comes out of the grave and the resurrection, right? The first person he meets there is Mary Magdalene. And um, in a society where Mary Magdalene could not have been a legal witness to anything, where she was such a patriarchal society, she could not have gone to um, a court of law and been allowed as a witness because of her gender. He made her the witness of the resurrection. The first gospel preacher was a woman. And you see Jesus elevating women um, in all of the time. And I think so many of us, uh, I encourage pastors, especially male pastors, we need to take our cue from, from Jesus here um, and realize that, uh, like Galatians says, there is no male or female, there is no Jew or Greek, there is no slave or free, we are all one in Christ Jesus, um, and that we are uh, equal, and uh, that we need to be practice, practicing egalitarianism in our lives, our homes, and in our churches. I don't even know where to start. So there are so many layers uh, there's so many layers of things that I could say, but I guess mine are peppered with a lot of racial stuff. Uh, in addition to being a female, in addition to being a leader in my church, and so there are so there's so much egregious stuff I've seen and experienced. And I look around me, and I just see whenever something gets into the into the spotlight, everybody runs to it. So now we're supposed to, you know, we're starting these diversity groups, and I. Sometimes I just don't see the legitimacy of them or, or the effectiveness of them. I still have people come to me, a lot of people come to me as African-Americans just trying to find a safe place to talk about all the stuff they've been through. And they're not finding that in the church and they're not finding it on their jobs. And so, um, you know, that's what I kind of um, see that as I'm able to provide them with a safe place to talk about their pain on so many levels. And so I guess, the, so the conversation is kind of overwhelming to me when I think about it and all that, you know, all that could be said. I, I just left the PCA church primarily because I had a position of leadership and I just couldn't deal with the racism and the sexism and all these things that I experienced when I was in it. And I didn't want to be a pawn and I didn't want to send the wrong message to people either. And so I, after much prayer, I stepped down I still go to a PCA church, but I'm more on the periphery right now doing grassroots stuff, you know, starting groups with women, um, talking about things. So I guess that's where I'm at right now um, in, in many different ways. Uh, I wish there was more genuineness in um, the frenzy that's going on to, I guess, promote fairness um, in several, you know, on the job and in the church but I'm skeptical about it. And, um, you know, a lot of times when I have conversations with people, uh, like you, many of you say, you don't know what you don't know. And some people just don't know and don't understand the plight of others. And I get it because you're not walking 
that plight. So it's hard to relate to it. But honest, honest conversations do happen. I've been part of lots of really honest conversations where people just get in the weeds and they just want to get down and dirty about what's going on in people's lives. And that's if you were to ask me where change happens, that's where it happens. When we're when we're brutally honest with each other, yet respectful and loving each other with that lens of not wanting to cause pain and hurt. Michelle, thank you. Just for everyone's benefit, please tell what uh, PCA means. Presbyterian Church of America. That's what I thought. Okay. Before we move on, I just wanted to add, because I, I think I mentioned two books. I didn't say the title or the author, so I don't know why. So the two books I was talking about, the first one, uh, The Chalice and the Blade by Rihanna Eisler, and then The Creation of Patriarchy by Gerda Lerner fascinating books um took me a while to read them i had to step away they're not hard to understand it's painful it's painful i think there's a really important point here that you know you define pa the, the patriarchy as a system and and this sort of systemic power over women but you know, I think it's it's really important to because I think you know sometimes I've heard people say, but you know, good men um, will will be good men whatever system they're operating in, and I think there is an important thing to acknowledge and recognize, which is that men are uh, you know kind of equally impacted by patriarchy in the sense that they're not oppressed by it, but they are infected with it, um, and so you know I think there are men out there who think that they don't operate within the patriarchy and they are blind often to the privilege that they have within the patriarchy and to their complicity within it because it's so very very normal and and I think that's true of women too you know and I think you said it Jackie when you um, introduced yourself that there are ongoing ways in which I am blind to my own participation participation in the patriarchy and so I think what you were saying Zach is really important that um, uh, or, or rather on the back of what you said, Julianne, that you know nobody has to be perfect to come to the table on this issue and it's okay to change our minds and it's okay to grow and it's okay to to not do a full 180 all at once and I think that's really important because because those words are frightening to people because they I mean I, I've come to this conversation knowing that I don't have all my thoughts and theology together on this topic and and that it's still important even though I, I, don't, I might feel afraid that oh if the conversation goes this way I don't know how I feel about that and so you know I guess that that's our offering to those who have yet yet more to learn is that we're all I think unless unless I really am in a minor, minority I hope that everybody else here would also say that they're still on that journey and so don't don't uh, exclude yourself from the conversation because you don't know that's that's a good reason to be here not out there i also want to just um you know like michelle brought up kind of questioning maybe the motivation or the genuineness of some of the progress that is i i mean i think there's definitely genuine progress and like you said honest conversations that are being had and I think it's not something we can force and maybe sometimes we're forcing it. You know, in my background coming from Mormonism, all trying to think if that's too big of a word, I will just say the progress that has been made in Mormonism has come about because initially like polygamy, the government was going to seize all of their assets. That is why that went away. And it didn't go away. It didn't go away. And you know, the discrimination against Black people in Mormonism also went away because of the threat of government. It is still in text. It is still in used script. And it's still there in your average member sitting in the pew. So I just, I, I wanted to highlight coming from a faith tradition that, you know, I know it doesn't have a past. And they're not talking about the past, right? They're saying we're making changes without acknowledging why they made the mistakes of the past, without acknowledging they made mistakes in the past, and that it did a lot of damage. They're not acknowledging that. They're just saying we're different. But the text has not changed. And the script has not changed. They're also not doing that over the pulpit. They're doing that at conferences. They're doing that, you know, in front of cameras. 
they're not doing that over the pulpit. I just want to say something briefly in reference to what Kat said a few moments ago. Some of you know I was a Roman Catholic priest um, at one time, and obviously the Roman Catholic Church still does not permit women to be ordained. And it was something that um, was often really bothered me. However, um, for quote, the good of the church, I went on with that. But in my 14 years of ministry, I really saw how often women across the board were so impacted uh, by that, so hurt and so devastated and so discriminated um, by that. So it just was a very, very painful reality. So um, with that in mind, I'd like to um, ask us then to reflect on this next question. What are the, uh, the sacred scripts? I think we've already talked a great deal um, about that. But then um, what are the gender roles taught in the system? And I think we've talked much about that already, but we could reflect on that and then Gina will follow up with the next question. Well, and I think just to expand on what you're saying, Brian, I think we're like, is there anything else that we want to acknowledge here about um, how both the men and the women are influenced and affected by the patriarchy? Like, what are we getting from those sacred scripts? What's it telling us? How has that affected the way that we're brought up um, as both boys and girls? Anything else that we want to acknowledge with that? I want to say quickly, I think Kat's point uh, a second ago was really important about the freedom that's found for both women and men in um, equal and egalitarian relationships. And that um, I think God has a real interest in setting free both pe people who are being oppressed and the oppressors. Um, uh, people who are doing the oppression um, are being infected with the toxicity as well. Uh, they experience it differently, obviously. Um, but I think about, I read a lot of uh, liberation theology um, out of the, the Black church and um, the Hispanic Latino church. And uh, one of my favorite authors is a guy named Leonardo Boff. And he talks a lot about this idea that God flings the proud of heart to earth, the oppressors, uh, he brings the oppressors low so that they can be built up to realize that they are um, brothers and sisters, just like everyone else, and that they don't have to. Um, you know, be infected with the sins of oppression either. Um, and I'll just tell someone, you know, tell as a, a vulnerable thing that as someone who grew up in very fundamentalist uh, Southern Baptist world and that you and pastor in that world my first few years, um, being on the other side of this, even still with lots to learn and lots of biases and I'm sure extreme blind spots, um, the freedom that comes um, just as a male realizing that, um, I had been so infected by patriarchy um, to my own detriment, not just to the detriment of my sisters, which is obviously what we're talking about, it, I think is most important, um, but to my own detriment as well, um, that, that uh, I've experienced freedom and it's been a really beautiful thing. I'll quickly jump in on that. I've been also obviously impacted by the patriarchy. I wanted to touch on the, the term sacred scripts and, um, what concerns me that what I see on Twitter, um, I, I talk a lot about Twitter because that's a lot of lot of things happening there. But as I mentioned, the Theo bros, and um, th that's a group of men, uh, you know, conservative, fundamentalist um, leaders who have a loud voice in what they are determining as sacred scripts. And so what I want to encourage um, is, you know, they have the platform, they have a big, big platform, and people are following them, but they are following their interpretation of sacred scripts. And so what I would like, I remember I went to um, a conference with um, some biblical scholars, Philip Payne, Ben Witherington, um, who else was there? Ron Pierce. And these are truly biblical scholars. These are men who were complementarian in their beliefs. And they started digging more and they found, wait a minute, that's not what the original languages say. And they went the opposite direction and said, I need to tell people, this is not what it says. 
So they switched because they dug deep. So what I would like to encourage people, when you hear sacred scripts, whose sacred scripts are, which lens are you getting that from? Because it may not be correct. So I think part of being in abusive systems and learning how to deal with um, being healthy is using our own critical thinking skills and really doing some work ourselves and seeing what does it say. Don't just stay within your own little circle, venture on out and see what other people are saying as well and see if it aligns. And then then you might come to some different conclusions. Amen, Julianne. I am um... As I was kind of making a few notes before I came here, I wrote down the question, what's in the scriptures? And, and my immediate response to that was, well, it depends who you ask um, what's in the scriptures. And, and, um, and it got me thinking about, you know, I, if I buy a product on Amazon, for sure, I'm going to read the Amazon reviews and I'm going to see what other people have said about that product and how they've enjoyed that product. Um, and, and that's going to play a part in the choice that I make as a consumer. But if that product arrives and it's not what I thought it was, I'm going to send it right back. Um, and I'm going to base my overall experience of that product on, on what I have experienced with it, no matter what the reviews say. And I, I feel like as as um you know as a church going christian nobody really ever taught me to figure stuff out they taught me to listen to what i was fed and to exist within a culture and so as i thought about this question i thought that's the main thing that i see my clients doing is figuring out what what's really in the text and what's really in the culture and how are those two things different and and often that's enough like often that's the place where they go oh, Oh, okay. Those are two very, very different things. Um, and then they they begin to think about their own scripts because I think that those, you know, what's in the the scriptures and what's in our scripts and and our life stories are are really two very different things. Um, and you know, fundamentally, when you ask about gender roles, I literally had this conversation with somebody this morning, which is that what is expected of me, and I've experienced this as a pastor's wife you know what's expected of me as a pastor's wife is to be sweet to be agreeable to stand at the door and greet people with a smile maybe to wear a tweed skirt and to bake some cupcakes every now and again and and you know my I'm sure my husband's church were very disappointed because I was never I was never going to be that and I was never going to be able to be that but I you know I think it's super important that that people are encouraged to do their own their own work what what do I think that this is saying how is this relevant to me uh, and and you know for every argument that I can give you a citation for you can you can find a book that has something else to say so there is no definitive uh, interpretation of scripture that does not exist and anybody who tells me that they can come to the text clean I always think well you know you must be able to switch off your brain and your value system and your lived experience because I don't think that really is possible. And so I think what you said, what you're saying, Julie, is, is absolutely true. Do our own study, ask our own questions, bring our own experience. Because if if scripture does not speak to my own experience, then then what am I doing with it anyway? You know, I does it doesn't make sense to me this idea that we just approach it as a blank canvas. Yeah, this is this is crazy important. Um and and with Julianne's point of you have this kind of group of, of patriarchal fundamentalists, almost exclusively white men who are putting out their interpretation of the Bible as normative, right? They're saying, this is the baseline interpretation of the Bible. You're bringing a woman's perspective. You're bringing a, a black perspective. You're bringing a Hispanic perspective. You're bringing, but, like, but, but my perspective is normative. Um, and, and that's just garbage. I mean, like we, we all approach scripture from a place um, we, we bring our interpretations, our biases, our lived experience into it. Um, and uh, we uh, <laughs> talking so much about Twitter today, but bringing it back to people like Beth Allison Barr and Kristen Dumay, who are constantly attacked by this group of people as not believing the Bible because they have a different interpretation. And that is always the clobber is like, oh, you don't actually believe the Bible. No, I just interpret something differently. Um, and I have a whole host of biblical scholars that think the same thing. So I'm not just like out here on my own making crap up, you know, like I'm trying to do the best that I can. Um, and I think a, a quick question when, when I uh, affirm everything that y'all said about do your own work, 
go into the text, read diverse people, all of that stuff. Here's a great question to be asking. When you come across an interpretation, ask, who does this interpretation benefit? Who does this interpretation benefit? Because if you come across these oppressive patriarchal interpretations, the question, who does this benefit, is the people at the top of those systems, right? And so when you start to question those interpretations, the reason they come after you so hard is because so much of their power is built up on these interpretations, these very specific interpretations, and I think erroneous interpretations of scripture. So who does this benefit is a really important question. And if the answer is not, this benefits all of humanity and God's desire to bring shalom and peace and abundant goodness to all people of all time, um, then it's probably not a great interpretation of scripture. One of my mentors, Lisa Sharon Harper, talks all about how if the gospel is not good news for all people, then it's not the gospel of Jesus. Right. So I think that's an important question to ask. What I was just thinking too, in my faith tradition growing up in conservative Christian uh, denominations, I heard the language of having a personal relationship with God. And it's like what we're saying, if we all come to it, like God reaches out to humanity and he meets people in the most unique ways <laughs> and times. And it's outside the church building. And that was so much part of my faith of this personal relationship with God. And yet I was also in a highly patriarchal system where in some ways it was in contrast to that doctrine that like I needed to run everything by men leaders. You know, I, I was deeply ingrained in me and or was for the first 40 years of my life to defer to male leaders as if I couldn't discern personally who God was what it was, you know, I need to run everything by that. But when I, when a cataclysmic event hit my life and I was sitting in the debris and I think Kat, you made reference to that. Like sometimes that is like, we have, some of us have these events in life where the blinders literally fall off. And because of the trauma of that, we're left asking all kinds of questions we wouldn't have asked anyway. And some of those systems started to fall apart. I mean, literally like the people I had turned to, the PhD faith leaders for help that happened to be some of my family members, like their advice for 15 years started to break down for me. And that's part of what led to this catastrophic um, event. You know, then I started asking all these questions. And when I stepped into the recovery world, which was more in the behavioral health world, with therapists and trauma specialists and that kind of thing, that's where I found this whole new world of people that were not judgmental. They validated my experience. They helped me in a way that I never received help. I hadn't in the faith community. And I kept running into God stories. Like people, like we talked about it differently. We talked about spiritual experiences and awakenings and 12 step language about a higher power, but like it was real. It was more real in some ways than what I had experienced in my church communities. And that was very telling for me as a church girl who thought it had to look a certain way. God expanded my view. Like, and it became, um, you know, that I had heard this phrase spiritual, not religious. And I identify that way now more. I'm like, I, I'm not so religious, and to me, religious is man-made. I'm more, I see God everywhere, and I believe that he's at work, and um, so, but that to me is part of the, the problem that patriarchy created for me. It was just so narrow-minded, and, um, and just being beat up with this, you know, really, it's, you are off base, Gina, like you are just limited in your viewpoint. And one of the things I, you know, because we wanted to talk a little bit about the lived experience, but I brought a book that just to tell a quick little story to give an example. I, when I was 23, I married and I married into a big Armenian family. And the, my former father-in-law was a seminary professor and a pastor and he was a double PhD, he was on a pedestal. You know, everyone respected him and I had the privilege of becoming his daughter-in-law. And then my mother-in-law was um, a women's director at mega churches. And so I esteemed them, I turned to them for help over years. At 
17 years, I divorced their son um, because of issues in his own life that had gone unaddressed and unhelped and that shattering event happened. And that was disobedient in their theology. There was no grounds for divorce, even despite their knowledge of what had happened. But two years ago, mind you, I, that was five years post-divorce. I even got this book in the mail from my former mother-in-law. And it's written by um, a Christian woman who, and it's called The Right Kind of Strong. And even post-divorce, she still is sending me this, um, this sense of like, she Amazon gifted me. We don't have a relationship, haven't, but she was, it's an emphasis on there's a godly way that a strong woman looks like a strong, a godly strong woman looks different than the kinds of strengths that I think I've adopted over the years. <laughs> and I just thought that that, to me, that was the epitome of the patriarchal systems and the oppression I was under that I, I was breaking out of a system, not just a marriage, because I just wasn't um, showing up the way that was, that they expected me to. And I wasn't getting the help that I needed as I was reaching out for help. So um, anyone else want to comment on uh, a lived experience? I wasn't commenting on a lived experience. I can, I have a lot of them, but um, I wanted to talk just for a minute about those gender roles a little bit more because I think um, Gerda Lerner in her book, The Creation of Patriarchy does an amazing job of breaking down, you know, starting in, you know, the Mesolithic, the Neolithic time period, kind of describing what archaeologists have discovered and found. You know, last year in January 2021, I was reading a New York Times article, and they had found this 9,000-year-old skeleton that clearly was a warrior, had smaller legs than typical, but buried with weapons, all of that type of stuff, right? Because of forensic technology now, they were able to do a um, DNA test and they're looking for a protein that can determine male or female um, through this DNA protein found in the teeth, right? So they did that and they found that it was a female. And they had 26 other remains that they had all assumed, right? The assumption was that this was male. So they thought, oh, well, if this one's a female, we have these 26 other ones, maybe we should test them. 11 more were female. So even some of these gender roles that we think have always been there because of male strength or aggression or testosterone or what, like actually the archeology span is showing that's not the case. And in these Neolithic cultures, when they were more of a partnership model, right? I mean, this is hunter and gatherers, women had access to power, women knew about plants, women, you know, they, they were part of gathering crops. I mean, that's, that's a power, having power over food sources, that's power, right? And she talks about this agricultural revolution that then, you know, people started to stay in one place. Well, now they could start to have abundance, which also led to this need to protect. If I, I can have my land, I'm not moving in the next season, right? We're not packing up and leaving and having to start over again. So now I can have land and maybe I want more land and I'm going to need more people to, to do that land, right? To work the land and to get me more stuff. And so she's like, this is, you know, for some, for some thinkers, they will say, this is where patriarchy probably originated, right? Again, it evolved over thousands of years, but she's saying this is where, you know, in order to get more people, we started to see, she quotes a, you know, famous 20th century century archaeologist who talks about the practice of women stealing or bride stealing, where they would go take other women because of that ability she had to reproduce and bring more people into the tribe, which makes me more powerful and makes me a larger part gives me more stuff, right? And as this is happening, um, you know, she's talking about, you know, shortly after this is when people started to write this down. I mean, shortly, we're talking a couple thousand years, right? But still, people are starting to write stuff down. And she's talking about this woman stealing. This was heartbreaking to me. And just 
you know, because especially at that time, women were vulnerable in childbirth, you know, maybe they didn't always make it through. And so we needed more women to be having babies. You know, she talks about, she identifies, this is the beginning of the reification of women where women became a commodity and their ability to create and procreate became something that men started to feel they had ownership of because it led to their ability to gain power and to have land. And she's, you know, all of these things, we had a choice. We were living a different way. And not to say that we always had to be on the move, but we didn't always have to move into patriarchy. Right. And, and I think, you know, she, she goes on to talk about that as we were staying in one place and technology continued, it also freed up time. Not for women though. Women are pregnant, we're lactating, we're breastfeeding, we're raising, we're feeding children. Women and their responsibilities did were not relieved because of the technologies in farming, but men's were, and men had more free time. And what did they do with that free time? They gathered. Right. So now we have the beginning of men's spaces. Women's spaces are at home, right? Respectable women mostly were indoors taking care of kids. And men could start to create languages and interpret symbols and create laws and discuss what should be and what is and what's right and what's wrong. We have all of this coming. And part of that, yeah, as women, we bear children, right? But it was the reification of women when women and their ability to create life was no longer worshiped or celebrated or even respected, but it had become a commodity, right? And so some of the biblical scholars would still say and argue, right? These female goddesses that were worshiped for their ability to create life and give life and be life-giving, you know, they became subjugated to these male gods in patriarchy. Um, the snake, often they were holding snakes right and the snake becomes a serpent yeah. i think what we did here today is just really give an acknowledgement to the fact that uh there's a there's a lot out there like there's a lot that we can read that we can listen to um there's conversations to engage and uh thanks to the society for the advancement of uh, sexual health we're even doing it here in this community and we're gonna keep the conversation going. I'd like to echo what Michelle um, said a, a while ago. This has been um, really incredible. I actually, I feel so overwhelmed right now myself with how much information has been shared, but more so the passion and heart that I've really heard here. As, an, as, a, as a white male, I'm continued to be challenged and humbled by what I'm um, hearing here today.